Hi guys, welcome back to Wayfair and let's not waste any more time. I hope you enjoy and let's get into it. I don't care if Kane gets himself burned alive, you say. He got himself into this mess, he can get himself out. Do you know who they are? Aaron asks why they attacked you. They work for the Viridian Lady. Though Kane wasn't too thrilled about Wayfarers, he could have been acting on his own. Either this was our typical hairbrain mercy during or the lady put them up to it. Aaron shakes his head. That doesn't seem like her. Too. He pauses, searching for the right word. Boorish, you offer? I was going to say lazy. Aaron pulls his cloak tight around his shoulders. Perched as he is on the edge of the roof, he resembles a sad, ruffled bird on the rain. It's too obvious, isn't it? Pitting her mercy against the Count's mercy? Maybe she knows we suspect her, you suggest. Maybe it's a warning. She's the Count's rival. She has an eye for magical antiquities. And she was in attendance at the gala. We'd be a fool not to investigate her. That's true, I suppose. Where are we with the other leads? Did you find anything at the docks? Only hints. If you want to be generous, Aaron shifts his weight, balancing carefully on the roof's shingles. Nothing more than what we already know. I keep hearing mentions of the collector and the coat. That's all that Dawkins wanted to talk about. They say he's been running his warehouse staff rag. Moved a lot of stock recently. Where it is, he's closing up shop soon. Hmm, you purse your lips. Sounds like he's trying to run. Yeah, and then there's a man in Edgewater who goes by Fisher. Apparently he've left the count services around the time that Shelley went missing. Your eyes narrow. People don't leave the count service. Exactly. Aaron slides in the shingles to the roof edge and perches precariously on the ledge. The bow strapped to his back glitters bright white in the rain. Well, shall we? You are not. Aaron flashes you a grin and drops down into the street below. You follow quickly, sliding down the shingles to the edge and leaping off. You land gracefully on the road, the wood platform buckling a little under your feet. Um, I'm not gonna read these all because... I think I already know what's going on. We're gonna go to Edgewater first, because I trust that. Headed home so soon? Aaron raises an eyebrow. Our day has just begun. You roll your eyes. I want to talk to the so-called servant. If he's out from under the count's shadow, he may be willing to talk. Aaron doesn't look convinced. If you say so, he pauses. Are you sure? No, let's go to the cove. Off to the cove then, Aaron says the collector seems a little weasley if you ask me. I figured a collector of magical entities is a good place to start, you say, even if he doesn't have it, he may know searching. Good point, he pauses, are you sure? Yeah, let's do this one. You walk on ahead, but he doesn't fall. You turn perplexed and find him staring at you with a strange look on his face. What? You ask. He's silent for a long time. When he finally speaks, he calls you by a name he's only using a handful of times since your reunion, why years ago. Off to the cove then, Aaron says the collector seems a little weasley if you ask me. I figured a collector of magical entities is a good place to start, you say, even if he doesn't have it, he may know searching. Good point, he pauses, are you sure? Yeah, let's do this one. You walk on ahead, but he doesn't fall. You turn perplexed and find him staring at you with a strange look on his face. What? You ask. He's silent for a long time. When he finally speaks, he calls you by a name he's only using a handful of times since your reunion, why years ago. Let's choose Ash. And Ash will be fine. He says, yeah. He pauses, pressing his lips together, but whatever thoughts are whirling in his mind right now, you will not be privy to them. He shakes his head and strides forward, catching up with you. Never mind, he says. Um, let's go with the first one. I know, he says, and I'll take sure to take you up on the offer one day or another. He smiles and walks past you, heading down the road. 
As far as Rona is concerned, the cove is neutral ground tucked along the western coast. The cove is located on a small peninsula that shuts out into the sea. The trees and foliage that are here spaced out between shops and buildings. Compared to the rest of the city, the effect is unusual, evoking other either a sense of harmony harmony between Rona's residents and the land they occupy, or an inevitable standstill in the war between nature and civilization. The district remains beyond the control of the seven, their agreed upon no man's land. Here the streets are less overgrown and generally clean, at least by Rona's standards. The boardwalks are in place before rot sits in and excess of trash and litter are pushed into the water where it is taken out to sea by the tide of floats rather further into the marsh. The cove is commercial district and little else. Merchants drawn by the seven agreed upon neutrality flock to the cove to sell their wares, whatever those may be. There is a general lack of rule regarding what they can and cannot sell, and so it boasted both more oddities and questionable ethics in regards to goods and services than most Rosinian cities. And yet, because of those devious quirks, the cove is one of the few places where you can regularly and easily find the supplies that make your life and your trade easier. The third block is home to the district's undesirables, merchants who make a modest living finding or crafting, then selling equipment and tools that make a life in Rona viable. Their goods aren't flashy or unique, but they are necessities. Near the beginning of the block is an artificer who specializes in crafting all sorts of useful odds and ends for your trade. At the end, in the most rundown building in the cove, and in danger of falling off the boardwalk and singing into the wetland, in an apothecary, he sells an assortment of medicinal supplies deemed pointless by most of the city and dream weed under the table to make ends meet. This leaves the second block, squished between the extravagant establishments of the first and the decrypt business of the third is a square mile dedicated to specialty shops. Imported goods from around the Cobalt Sea and beyond make their appearance here, many of them acquired through less than legal means. There is a narrow bookshop whose owner's walls are painted to resemble an ancient tomb, completed with runes and various other scrawlings you don't understand and have a feeling are just for show anyways. Not too far away is a blacksmith who specializes in magic imbued weapons and armor. His work is always in demand, particularly by the seven, and while most of it is useless to you, you never know when he may have something of value. His smithy blows smoke into the sky, day and night, and his neighbors complain on the hour. Every time you visit the cove, there's been some altercation of the smithy. You're surprised the blacksmith managed to get anything done. The largest building on the block by far is Runes and Relics, the shop of the notorious artifact collector. It immenses display and sells items of all kinds, from the mundane to the rare to the outright dangerous. The proprietor is a particular pendant fellow with necessitum and rebuilt the entire front facade of his shop to resemble Arsenian architect. And he is your target. Whoa, Aaron says as he approaches the shop. A bit much, don't you think? The artifact collector's shop is a difficult eyesore to miss, a two-story monstrosity that looms over the rest of the block. You can spot it from a mile away, down the street in either direction. The shop foregoes the wood favored by most of Rona's buildings and instead sports a facade crafted from beautiful white stone, which is assumed to be formerly beautiful white stone. It's withered now stained with mud and crawling with vines. Someone has made an attempt to clear them to no avail. The walls are tall and imposing, set with large windows crafted from thick imported glass. Two white stone columns frame the door, a hefty thing constructed from dark wood, set with a brass handle and engraved with fanciful symbols you're pretty sure mean nothing. A sign extends from the second floor wall, swinging back and forth in the wind. Runes and Relics East, 1236, Proprietor Lars Drakehead. It's the only sign in the entire cove. 
You think all that stone would have sunk into the sea by now, Aaron adds, rounding up the building. Magic holding it in place, no doubt. He shoots you a side-eyed look. Think we'll break it? You roll your eyes. Surely he has stronger enchantments than that. Aaron flashes you a grin. Want to bet on that? You feel the handful of loose coins rattling around in your pocket. The limited funds you have. Okay, I'll bet, all right, but on something other than money. Ooh. You raise an eyebrow, huh? He says, barely able to contain his smile. What did you have in mind? If I'm right, you owe me your most embarrassing secret. If I'm right, you owe me a favor to be called out at any time and without warning. If I'm right, I get to choose where we're going once Rona is left in the dust. He grins, blue eyes sparkling. Okay, Ash, she says, you're on. You return the smile and together you turn towards the shop. Remind me what we know of Drake Hand, you say, taking in the hefty white stone and the heavy set door. Other than he's running his warehouse staff rag, not much. Aaron replies, he's been moving a lot of stock and word is he's closing up shop soon. Something has him scared. If he has anything to do with the chalice, he better be. Shall we find out? You nod, and together you stride up the steps to the front door and pull it open. Inside is a small foyer, illuminated by a chandelier. A rug, once a rich red, now faded to grayish pink, and embroidered with geometrical patterns in gold. Covered in white stone floor, two busts, one of an elven man and the other of a human woman, both nude are displayed on pedestal that flank a set of shallow steps leading up to the main room. Despite this valiant attempt at grandeur, there are noticeable cracks in the pavement stone, stone tarnished on the chandelier and plaster flanking off the busts. Hmm, he murmured, stop, stooping and gently pressing a hand against the stone floor. Nothing's broken. Looks like those hordes are better than you thought. Give it a minute. A loud thud blooms across the room beyond. You exchange looks with Aaron, hand on your hilt, hurrying across the foyer, and dart up the stairs. Chaos reigns in the shop's main room. The wide rectangular space is a maelstrom of boxes to display cases and artifacts. Its dark wood floor is spotted with footprints and littered with papers, manifest records, memos, and all kinds of personal notes. The floor to ceiling windows are covered with heavy Wine red tapes blocking the view from outside. Employees in red and black uniforms rush about, cracking open cases, heaving out inventory, and hefting busts and statues to the floor. Near the back, some staff duck in and out of door frame, covered by a velvet curtain. Near the above it was a sign that read staff only. A red faced, red haired dwarf in an elaborate coat stands in the middle of the den, barking orders and mopping his sweaty brow with an embroidered handkerchief. He spots you and Aaron, freezes mints and then's mouth open, eyes wide with horror. Stop! The screeching shout blasts through the room. The staff stop moving immediately, dropping artifacts back into their cases. Freezing while crouching next to a pile of loose inventory or pausing in the act of checking a stack of papers. Two employees teeter with heavy box struggling to hold on and drops it. It crashes to the floor, landing on its side. The lid props open in a wave of collector's coins, cheap gemstones, and shoddily made jewelry slips out, cascading over the floor. The dwarf cringes, mopping his forehead so fervently. He leaves the red mark creased into his brow. Imbeciles, he mutters. He glances at you and Aaron with thin mouth quivering behind his red beard. This isn't what it looks like, he says. You cast an eye around the mess. Uh-huh. The dwarf laughs nervously. Just a little inventory management. He continues tugging at his collar. A little spring cleaning, as it were. He casts an eye around at the mess and tugs more forcefully at the collar. A bead pops off and bounces to the floor. Late spring cleaning. Very, very late spring cleaning. Aaron pushes past two very dead-eyed employees. You can drop the act, drink hand, he says. It's not worth the time or effort. I know you're getting ready to cut and run. It's all over the docks.
Dirty and bristles. Now look. He curses. Can't trust anyone to keep their damn mouth shut. He wrings his hand. Rings glittered on his fingers. Drawing himself up to the full height, Draken straightens his back and steals himself. Though he can't quite stop glancing at your sword. Downsizing is inevitable, he continues rattling off his speech like an actor rehearsing for a play. True collectors are not abundant on these fair shores, and Rona is a far cry from Nessistium. As you ought to know, runes and relics is a family business. I would never dream to liquidate our assets here without first informing my cousin. Please assure Kellyan that his investments are protected by my very own, as they are, have been for decades. It's kind of rude. You and Aaron enter the cove. The long, narrow main road stretches out before you, winding its way along the coast. Composed almost entirely of boardwalks, it is flanked on either side by one and two-story buildings. There are very few alleyways and side roads, the general consensus of what if your enterprise is not located on the main road, it is not worthy of business. There is an unspoken hierarchy here. The more desirable your goods and services, the closer to the coast entrance your building will be, if you can afford the rent. The buildings here are well kept, the overgrowth is trimmed back, the walls regular washed and painted bright colors. Conjured lights are strung along balconies and verandas, a welcoming sight in the rain. A hired band of mercenaries patrol the road, ready to quash any patrons deemed troublesome. It's a mystery what the mercenaries do with the offenders, but you have a feeling there are more than a few skeletons floating in the marsh. There's block bustles with a colorful assortment of taverns, dreamweed dens, and leisure homes with entertainment of all kinds on offer. The crowd here are lively, and later in the day, the busier the block becomes as workers flock to their favorite places to unwind and forget their troubles. You pass a line of taverns and catch an invigorating smell of seafood and spices lifting up and down the street. Your stomach growls. You didn't realize you were hungry. It's tempting to stop and eat, but you have more pressing matters to attend to.